Good evening, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Arboricultural Association headquarters here in Stonehouse in the UK for another Wednesday webinar. My name is John Parker, Chief Exec at the Association, and it's great to have so many of you joining me for the very first time in my new office, which is a bit bright, it turns out, through the window, but there we go. That's my problem, not yours. Please use the chat to say hello and to let us know where you're watching from. Select all panellists and attendees when you do so. If you've got any questions at all, please use the Q&A button. And if you want to go on camera to ask Ted a question directly, then you can say that in your question and we can sort that out as well. For those of you who are looking forward to the football this evening and nervously checking your watches, fear not. We're going to make absolutely sure we're all finished by 7.30 at the latest. So you've got plenty of time to go and be wherever you need to be. This evening, we're very excited to be welcoming back Ted Green for his second webinar. Before we get started, as ever, some brief announcements. Um, after this webinar, we're taking a couple of weeks off. That's recovery time after a Ted Green webinar. We take a couple of weeks off so we can relax. Um, and then we're returning on Wednesday, July the 28th with another cracking event. We're going to be joined from Switzerland by Naomi Zercher, a name that regular viewers might recognize from the chat and Q&A of these very webinars. I'm not sure if you're out there tonight, Naomi, but hello if you are. Uh, Naomi will be giving a presentation based upon a chapter of her recent book, In Consideration of the Tree offering her field observations of the tree, its structure and its function, and how that knowledge can inform ecologically based design from the perspective of building with trees. Um, our second speaker will be Len Gilman from New Zealand with his presentation, A Rosa by Any Other Name, Restoring Indigenous Names Within the Linnaean System. That's gonna be a really interesting and thought provoking webinar. So please register free via the link in the chat and we'll hopefully see you on July the 28th, so three weeks today. We are, of course, also nearing the main in-person event of the year, the Arboricultural Association Amenity Conference 2021, to be held in Loughborough in September. We really hope you can join us for that. Uh, early bird tickets are available now on our website. Not only will you get to enjoy dozens of amazing speakers and mingle with lots of tree folk, but you'll also get to join us on our field trip, which this year is going to be a special Thinking Arms Day at Cole Cabby, featuring none other than our special guest this evening, Mr. Ted Green, which neatly leads me to introduce the man himself. Ted, welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, how are you, folks? Surprised to see so many people want to listen to me rant and rave when we got footy on. And here, I don't know where you are, but it's a lovely evening. Anyway, there you go. You, you're going to suffer. Uh, one of the things we thought, though, was I would touch on uh, subjects which, well, I'll start again. What we're hoping to do in the autumn is have what we do, which is Reg Harris and myself, we have these uh, weekend events or Saturday events, different parts of the country, where we call them Thinking Arbs. And basically, they have a theme so that we can draw people in to just let's stand under one tree, because it's very difficult often, you know, when you do these meetings, and I've been doing them now for 20 odd years, to get arbs away from one tree. And of course, the other thing is, once they mention safety, I just walk off, because that just sucks, and they go on about it for all day. So... The idea was, I mean, we haven't had been, been able to have any thinking arb days. So why don't we do some in the autumn and um, have a theme, a theme, whatever. Let's talk tree roots. Let's talk about stub ends, all those sort of things which I go on about. And 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 um, and we, I get a few of the, what I call some of my friends in, which have been friends for 20 odd years and there's, they're still part of the old ancient tree forum and now thinking arbs and let's go around and just go somewhere and and and, and imagine we're somewhere and, and do a, a thinking arb theme so that's the idea for the for the autumn so what i thought was well if we want to do this in the autumn the last thing we want i want to do really is touch upon some of those themes and partly i probably touched upon them last time but because of my age I haven't got a very good memory. I've no idea what I talked about last time. So, um, so tonight I'm, I'm just going to touch on a couple of, uh, I suppose you could call them old chestnuts, things that rattle around. And uh, I was one of them. What inspired me, inspired me the other day was that 
I was talking to some people. I mean, they were talking about global warming, climate change, call it what you like. And one of them just said, oh, well, we're going to get more pests and diseases. And everybody went, mm, yeah, of course, we get all these more pests and diseases. But I, I stopped them and I said, well, excuse me. Yes, that is a case. That is a statement of fact. We will get more pests and diseases. But what we should have said was we're going to get different pests and diseases. Because some of the diseases we have today, if the temperature goes up, they fall off the end. So we lose some, but we gain some. But it's not just more. We will get a difference. And that, and it's the sort of thing which people will trot out, and which annoys me in a way, because they're not really thinking it through and saying, saying what I've just said. So you get more, but you lose some. And I'm very interested in that, really. And 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 I think it's it comes about in other in other aspects because then we apply the more pests of diseases rather than thinking that we're losing some. So I mean, the other one, of course, is that um, I'm very very interested in 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 the the leaf emergence because nobody really has bothered to think, or not I've come across anyway, to think. With climate change, what's going to happen to our trees? Apart from the classic, which was kicked off, I don't know, 15 years ago, must have been, where they said, oh, with, with climate change, we're going to lose beach. And I thought, hang on, lose beach? Oh, because it's going to be warmer. They, they don't like the warmth. So it was, I mean, I'm, I'm a born traveller. And uh, I'm always off looking at something or another. So we'd already been doing it, but it didn't really click. And that was, I've been looking at a lot of these places where you wouldn't expect to find beach, but it's doing very well. So I thought, right, this is it. Let's go and have a look. So I went back to places like um, Spain and Portugal. I mean, Portugal, for example, and Porto, for example, where... Temperatures have three months, if you like, of 30 degrees, and there's beach. Admittedly, it was in an arboretum or growing in the, in the, it was an amenity tree, but it was coping with 30 degrees for three months. And then we went up in the hills a bit further north of there, again, with virtually no rainfall and very high, strong temperatures um, uh, during the summer. Beach woodland. Come on, come on. What's going on here? What's going on here? You go right down the end of the Pyrenees on the on the Mediterranean side, and you can stand in beach woodland and seeing the yachts go by on the mid. I don't understand. And then I've got this crazy friend of mine in in, in Catalonia called Gerard, which he calls himself the um, an Arb doctor. And I know most of you heard me go on about this. I do not understand why people call themselves tree surgeons. Arborists are doctors. They're the GPs, the general practitioners. They look at trees all day. They study health. They don't just cut limbs off or cut them down. Well, I hope they don't. So why don't we change it? And he's sitting just over there now. Why don't you say to him, we've got to start introducing this word, arboricultural doctor. I'd like to see it on a van shortly. Not arboricultural consultant, arboricultural doctor. And let's see how the public respond to that. Because surgeon, obviously, is a very negative term because you're doing something, you're cutting something. And then most people will say, oh, they're killing the tree, blah, blah, blah. So I would love to do that. But anyway, back to um, these trips that we went on looking at trees. So they're looking at the in the Pyrenees or and then going down the Mediterranean coast. There are patches of oak. Sorry, there are patches of beech trees. Perfectly well within a mile or two miles of the, the Mediterranean coast. They're all laying out there in the sun. Where do they go and sit in the shade in some places north of Barcelona under beech trees? So what's this all about? It's going to die. And then the best one of all was being taken with um, Gerard. Um, let's something 60 to 100 miles south of Barcelona along the Mediterranean road, 20 miles inland, beech woodland. And I've actually got an old beach, which has got a nickname, like 
daddy or father or something like that being recognised by them as their, one, their oldest beech tree in that part of the world. So if we were looking at the science of it, then surely this is where we might be going to get twigs or cuttings or seed in the hope that that would then help some of the trees in, in, in Northern Europe, if it's going to change, who's doing it? So going on to other places, you know, uh, Slovenia. I remember being in Slovenia and um, my colleague, she was being interviewed in one of these government establishments. And the guy just waved his arms and said, oh, that's some primeval spruce forest. So of course I pricked my ears up, thought, Primeval, wham, straight out into this spruce, photographing it in the days when, if you like, transparency film cost a fortune. But there I was banging away, primeval. But Eastern Europe doesn't mean the same word as it does to us. It means primeval in the sense of that it hasn't been interfered with once it got established. Because when I walk back, having used a roll of film, which to me was quite expensive in those days, and chatted away, the guy just said, oh, well, um, we've got records of, say, six or 700 years ago. They cut all the beach down and it got colonised by spruce. He was calling it primeval. To him, it was primeval, the same as Bielovasia. Bielovasia, the great primeval forest, uh, 200 years ago, was wood pasture. Wood pasture wasn't forest. And, and now it's primeval and the bison, and there's one on the wall behind me, look. Um, uh, that's where they lived. No way. They don't live in the forest. There's nothing for them to eat. They go in the forest and go outside into the fields, and that's where they graze and browse in, during the evening and the night time. They ate in the forest, and I'll, hopefully I'll get back to that in a minute. So then again... And then, of course, we went to other what they call refugia. We've been to a couple of refugia in Italy, which is way down, which is perceived as the, 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 the right down the, the end of where they, in theory, possibly could live. But then, yeah, we went to Sicily. And if and when all this lot stops, if you want a holiday, go to Sicily. Forget the food. I mean, that's beyond belief. But we went there at the behest of some Italians and we went to see this huge sweet chestnut tree. It's called the tree of a thousand or hundred horses, because in theory, a hundred horses could get underneath it and it's vast. So you go and see that. But then you realise that there are other places which are national parks, primarily for trees. Have we got a national park for trees? No. These are national parks. And when you go there, there is a be an image of an information board that size. And it will have, say, holly or beech or oak or something on it. So it'll be in Italian. And it's also in English. Can you imagine us do that? You know, trees, putting a big information sign up, calling a place a national park for trees. And there we were in Spain. So nanga, 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 up we go. And we're walking through holly woodland. And there's some great big oak trees in it. They need haloing. So I might be calling to arms several arbs and saying, come out there with me and spend a couple of days um, or at least a few hours a day haloing some of these massive oak trees from competition from the art holly. And then we go off and have fun. We'll see. I guarantee I get a team of English sorry, a team of British arms to come with me and we can have a lovely time and see some trees. So nunga, 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 up we go through the holly, come out a bit higher up, and guess what? There are holly pollards, holly pollards. And I walked amongst them and I thought, I could be at Windsor. There are holly pollards at Windsor and there are holly pollards 1,300, 1,400 miles away south <clears throat> they are cut exactly the same or they were cut exactly the same as the ones at winter well that out you can hear africa they're always firing their guns just across the bang 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 you can hear it and then we go a bit further up another 
four or five hundred yards, and there are beach pollards, ancient beach pollards, exactly the same, cut in the same way as the beach pollards at Burnham Beaches, which is less <coughs> as the crow flies from Windsor, four miles. So what I think is they were being cut in the same period as they were cut either in Windsor or um, Sicily. Windsor, we know they were being cut as win winter fodder, especially on winters when there was snow on the ground um, to feed the, the deer. Because above, obviously, you know, above the, the brails height, they have prickles. They don't have prickles, they're smooth, smooth leaves. So I think the same was applying there. What they were cutting the beach for, I have no idea. But it's what it's trying to do for me is trying to encourage you to think outside our little island and look at what other trees, at what trees are doing. And, and, and it must come from arborists because I still don't think you speak anywhere near as loudly as you should do about trees. You know, I mean, I know I've been bragging about saying how, you know, you spend your life looking at trees and studying the health of them and all the conditions or whatever, but that doesn't come out. At the moment, there's a tree strategy for Britain. Where's the, where's the, where's the bit in there? Or where's the input from agriculture? It's been written by foresters. Now, I've got nothing against foresters because after Brexit, of course, uh, the timber prices have started to go up, as I expected, and I predict they'll get more and more. We get screwed for timber. So we definitely need foresters. And I've said this before on this, probably last time I spoke, but Churchill in the war with the Atlantic economies, uh, co convoys said the one thing that kept him awake at night was German submarines. Because those convoys coming from Canada and USA, or probably down in Africa, I don't know, they weren't just bringing tanks and ammunition and food, 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 food. They were bringing processed timber. Now, can you imagine 23,000 civilian uh, men on those sailors on those ships, crewmen died? And some of them died on a ship which was carrying processed timber. They died by processed timber. The biggest fire in Britain in the Blitz and the Germans were using it to guide them into central London was a, a stack of a, a huge stack of timber, processed timber on dockside in the London docks. So we do need foresters. We mustn't get away from that. But forestry should, not should, but forestry to me is only part of the tree world. And you know that because you're arborist. But where are you? Who's, who's speaking up? Who's speaking up for trees outside woodlands? I mean, in the next, the next um, magazine, there's a bit about where I talk about Red Riding Hood and the Dense Dark Forest, because that's another one that slipped into the thing is that we talk forests. We talk forests and we talk to foresters. But what about the landscape or the treescape outside woodland, the amenity trees? All those sort of trees are not in the thing. So Jill actually has got a meeting in Parliament with the overarching body of DEFRA, which is politicians, and she's going to be able to expand on that. And I've just been at a conference today where they've never heard the word wood pasture. Wood pasture? It's what half the world was like uh, the further we go back in time. And then, but they all go on about um, man cutting the forest down. What bloody fool would cut a tree down when he didn't have to because they got hundreds of miles of pasture woodland or wood pasture, open grown trees. And half your tree species are open grown. Uh, insect pollinated and if they're insect pollinated by they've evolved to be grown in the open have you ever seen a woodland of apple trees fruit trees no they're all open grown trees where they blossom 
So I'm going a bit off piece at the moment. Where was I? Oh, so um, I was talking about um, Sicily and thinking to myself that if only we could get people to start asking more questions. If they can grow down in Sicily, why, 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 why are we predicting this sort of thing? And I remember going to an ARB conference before I was speaking, and two of the uh, speakers before me, both arborists, use a word which you seldom hear outside the tree, outside your world, which is adaptation. Now, seventy-six, I watched lots of beech trees suffer. I saw some beech trees die. I didn't see young trees die. I saw trees which were probably going to go anyway. And most arborists can look at a beech tree and say, hmm, it's got another five years or whatever. It's suffering. It looks not very good. So the drought kicked it off. So it accelerated that tree's dis decline. There might have been another group of trees which were affected by the drought. And we're yet, yet even today to see what effects. So they, you know, it could have been things could have been triggered in them which are slowly taken over. So you've got an accelerated decline in some beech trees, but others are romping away. And you could say that's self-selection, and it's probably what's happened over the millennia. You know, we don't see the trees that died a thousand years ago, do we? So I'm very interested in what's going to happen because. What's going to happen? They're banging on about droughts now. We must have had droughts before. We must have had a series of droughts. Did we get the same thing where you get selections of trees or age classes or whatever that suffer? And the trees that survive, survive. And one of my best things that was after the 76 drought at Windsor, they had some roundels of oak, I don't know, 60, 60 years old quite closely grown, but a, a landscape round all. And those, that ground had been ploughed during the war. And it came out of ploughing maybe 20 years ago or something like that. But that's, so presumably the ploughing had meant that the oaks had really put roots down, down as well as along. The roots that went along, of course, got ploughed. So then, they came out of ploughing, and presumably some of the roots have come back near the surface, but this kept its roots down. When we had the 76 drought, no problem. They were perfectly all right. In fact, I'd love to take a group of people there and show them there are still cracks in the ground running for several metres in clay, in clay, they're there, and you can still stick a, deep, a stick down a meter. They've never closed back again. Now, so here we've got, well, not necessarily adaptation, but a response to a condition, which meant that in the future, those trees were, were, were uh, not affected by a condition, which in this case was drought. I'm losing my way here. Where am I? So anyway, um. What, so going on to the, staying with this um, uh, predictions of what's going to happen to our trees, I thought about local provenance. It's a, it's a, it's a, a minefield, it's a debate. Logically, you would say, yes, what well, we, we, you know, let's have pick trees that are growing there because in theory, logically, they're going to be the trees that survive. But Surely, in any planting scheme which goes on from now on, some people will stress local provenance, but why aren't we saying, excuse me, why don't you have, say, a proportion of local provenance and a proportion of trees from wherever? Because in history, looking at the oak trees at Windsor, they've come from all over Europe, definitely come from all over Europe. And uh, before I go back, before I finish with the beach, um, the uh, beach has also been perceived to be a northern, a southern tree, and not because of the all this crap talked about pollen. Um, 
it never it wasn't a native tree north of if you like manchester or somebody like that whereas they've got these fish traps which they fished out of somewhere other in a river in york york and they made a beach then you go up to carlisle and then two two examples near carlisle where um, the, um they fouled the beach they filled the celtic maple and you all know what that is now right in favour of the ash, because they said ash was the native tree of that woodland. Yeah, okay. So they found the sycamore, if you like, or Celtic maple, Elder Beach. What did they get? And now they've got Kalara. They've got a whole swathe of Himalayan balsam. What does that tell you? You know, we're not thinking. We're not thinking. We're not thinking. We're sticking to the old parameters we're sticking to the old paradigms whatever you call it i hate these words and then then we were in just we're in scotland marching along with snh and she came to in the woodlands two or three massive massive beautiful open grown beach which can they can grow open grown even even in in woodland because they're shade tolerant and they push everything back and she proudly said we're going to cut those down. This is when they really got out of it, proud. And we said, why? Oh, because of their, their invasive and their, their generation. I said, I can't see a beech seedling. Those trees have been there 100, 200 years, and there's not a beech seedling in sight, and you're going to cut them down. I said, they're some of the biggest beech trees I've seen in Europe. No, they've got to go. So that was it. So it wouldn't listen to me and walked off. So we go around the corner and there she stands there going, oh, look, look, these, these Douglas are some of the original seed that Douglas came back from North America. Aren't they wonderful? Historic man. So, of course, can you imagine what I said? You know, around the corner, you've got a native British tree. Beautiful, massive really got all the organisms possibly that it possibly could have anywhere in in Europe. And yet round the corner, you've got a tree, brilliant for timber, brilliant for timber. But here it was as a historic tree, and they were going to, they were, going to, they were preserving it. So I think we've got some very, very strange um, mental perceptions of different things. And I still put it down to arbs. So what else have I got here? Oh, well, I haven't finished, have I? Yeah. So, and then John White, I got a lot of time for John White. He's the uh, retired um, uh, um, dendro dendrochronologist of the Forestry Commission. Um, and head like this, full of information. And we were talking beach. And he said, well, he said, I'm very curious. He said, because there's a couple of glens up in Scotland somewhere which have got some nice beech trees in. I've never found it, by the way. And he said they are the same form and growth as some beech trees in Norway. So we started thinking about Vikings because I'd been to Denmark and a guy was telling us how they think beech arrived in the Baltic, around the coast, and in southern Sweden, and it was brought back by the Vikings coming back after they traded up and down the rivers of Europe. Remember, the, the rivers go north-south. And they were bringing it back as ballast. Well, beach mast ain't ballast. I've been thinking a lot about it. They either had some pigs in the bottom of the boat, or it was coming back for lamp oil or salad oil, or oil for cooking. So it's very, very valuable oil. And obviously some of it slipped out and they were assuming that's how it colonized most of the coastline in parts of the Baltic. And then of course the best story of all from that point of view, when we're talking Vikings is that, um, I wish I could get in touch with him again. There's a chap called, I think it was Colin Ferris. And if he's listening, please, I need to get in touch with you again because he was based in Leicester University and he was he wrote a nice paper in Tree News, you know, um, and it was about the DNA of oak trees. 
And what he did with the DNA of oak trees, he came to Windsor on the assumption that it had some of the oldest oak trees in Britain and the least likely to have been cross-pollinated. So they were Roba, so they've been least likely to be colonised by uh, Ceres, not Ceres, um, Petraea. So you, you didn't have this hybrid rosacea. So he came and took mitochondria it from the pollen of the trees of Windsor. And I don't know, was it from the leaves? I'm not sure now. Can't remember. He's got the DNA anyway. And he started looking in the UK at the oak trees, came up with some interesting stuff, which I'm not going to go into tonight. But he found that the Windsor DNA could be found at different sites, old castles and things like that, going up Britain. And the theory there was that, you know, no man can pass an acorn, really, can you? You've got to pick it up, throw it somewhere. So did the old knights, when they were visiting Windsor, actually pick up acorns, take them home? And he said, well, that's not all the story, because he said he'd been to Sweden and he found DNA around an old Swedish castle, oak, Windsor oak. Windsor oak DNA, I should have said. Yeah. So I said, well, how did that get there? What do you think happened? So he said, well, the further you go back in time, precious objects were packed in acorns, like you do polystyrene now. And so this old Viking had stolen something from the UK, packed it in acorns, gone home, not seen you know who for, say, 10 years pulled out the object, gave it to her, threw the acorns out the window, and they rushed upstairs and life started all again. Now, that's moving seed around. So when we talk in local prominence, you've got to be seriously, seriously careful in what was the origin of the seed. Because going back to climate change, which is what I was supposed to be talking about, um, I there was an old... A scientific observation that trees came into leaf on the Atlantic side primarily to do with day length light, right? Whereas the further you go east, leafing occurred with a rise in the temperature. Because in theory, the continental, the continental weather, whatever it was at that period, would more likely to be stable. So that's how it worked. Since then, a friend of mine, Kevin Frediani, who, who's got to do one of these webinars, we've got to get him off. He's pointed out that things have really changed quite a bit since then. More and more people are looking up this lovely word of phrenology. And, um, and it's connected to now, leafing is connected to day length, temperature, I want to add one which is soil temperature, which I'll come back to, and um, sunlight. So although you can have day lengths, sunlight is something different. So but you get more sunlight. Well, if it's a sunny day, you get more sunlight in day length. So he was saying that's more likely how most plants respond, which I find very interesting because um, I can't work out in my head, and some of you that live in the south of Britain would have seen it, and it's called cherry plum. It's a prunus, and that come out, can come out in January. We, we know it's not, well, we don't know it's native. We assume it's not native, but it comes out, and its fruit can be like a green gauge, a Victoria plum, or an apricot. It can have a whole host, and it was, it's in France, it's a very popular a plum for making jam, but it's wild. And here, in my part of the world anyway, it's quite common. You find it quite a bit, but it comes out very early, January, February, it's out in leaf. So where's that come from? And it's a tree in my mind that hasn't changed, adapted to the area it's living in, yeah? And then the other big question for me is sweet chestnut. At the moment where I am here, it's sweet chestnut, it's still got catkins. So it's coming to leaf late and it's fruiting or flowering late. So 
that must is that another tree which came from the Mediterranean? I don't know. That's one of your assumptions. Came from the Mediterranean, but it hasn't changed. It's a it's a can of worms. This I think because and then um, we were in Australia. We were quite a bit way inland from the uh, east coast, east coast, and um, we were in a park. And I was going apoplectic because there were elm trees like I knew as a kid in Britain, massive in this park. Massive, beautiful elm trees. Just over there were a few oak trees, lovely open grown oaks in the parkland, ground, swathes of acorns. Those trees had adapted to the southern, whatever, cycle. They'd adapted. But what's, what's wrong with this sweet chestnut and the prunus? I can't get it. I don't, I don't know. This, to me, it it must help arboriculture if we could understand what's going on. And my best one lately is um, we've got some really, this is Windsor. If you look on the map, it's one of the drought areas of the UK going around the East Coast, right up to Aberdeen, by the way. So this is the driest part of Britain, which means it's probably one of the driest areas of Europe. What have we got? Beautiful sequoia sempervirens. We got sequoia janclea because that's a mountain tree. So it's in a different climate zone up there, cold and wet, not you know, cold and whatever. But these are sempervirens. Read all the books, coastal redwood, bathed in mists from the Pacific, drenched in mists from the Pacific, moist atmosphere, warm. Windsor, dry, cold east winds regularly, and I've been sticking my neck out and I'm hoping somebody will look at it, but I'm not convinced there's any high ground between Windsor and the Urals. So there's cold winds, cold desiccating winds over the years those sequoias have been growing. They're grown. And the first thing that's going to get them is going to be lightning strikes because they're going out through the top and any tree that goes through the top it gets quite zapped by lightning. So I don't understand. I'm, 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 I don't understand. I mean, how are we doing for time, sir? He's not listening. We, of course I'm listening. I'm listening, I'm reading, I'm looking. You've got as much time as you could ever possibly want, sir. You've been going like no, no. half an hour, you're fine. Yeah, what about anybody want any questions yet? You got any questions? We can duck into some questions and comments yeah, and stuff if, if you, you like. I'm 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 not I'm 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 well into it. That's why. Well, it's up to you. We can do a couple of questions now. Or you yeah, can crack yeah, on. Yeah. We can do questions at the end. No, let's do them now. No. Okay. Well, I was going to see actually if let me see if we can do this by magic because I was going to see if John Parsons, if you're out there, if you wanted to go on camera because uh, John made an interesting point about the uh, nature's calendar website from the Woodland Trust head. I think Woodland Trust, yeah, no, we don't call it the Woodland Trust. We call it the Plantation Trust. I would not no, comment John. on that. I highly respect and appreciate my colleagues at the Woodland Trust. Hey, oh, John. Yeah. John you, I was going to say, John, you made a good comment in the in the chat. I thought it would be good if you could talk a bit about nature's calendar as well, if you wanted tell to. Me, tell familiar. me, tell me about it. But then you also asked a good question in the Q&A bit. So, John, over to you. Hi, Ted. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, and you. Yeah, and you. Um, uh, uh, Trey, the army tag. You remember that one? You. That's a, that's that's a good one. one. Yeah. You came and visited that one with me. That's a good one, that one. Um, yeah, um, remember, Ted, before we did the uh, Ancient Tree Hunt uh, website, I built the Phenology website. So that was allowing um, uh, people around the UK to record the flowering of budburst and all other species that uh, that do their thing in response to climate change. And it was building on a, a guy that had started recording uh, species in their gardens from 1736, I think they'd started. So there's a massive data set of of data uh, for species bud burst. Um, so I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. Um, and uh, no, the, the question was um, about, I'm sure there was something going on around the time that um, they were talking about 
obviously things getting earlier in, in the uh, spring and, and later in the winter and that causing problems. But then were people highlighting that if a tree didn't reach its freeze point, that they were thinking that it wasn't the, the arrival of spring and the warmth, it was the cold that a tree needed to, to kick it into life. And its freeze point started the wake up process. And if a tree didn't reach its freeze point in the winter, it would never wake up and we'd end up with these zombie trees, I think they call them, the trees that just wouldn't wake up um, in, in the summer and wouldn't come back into burst. And um, just hearing your stories about trees in other countries, I don't know how trees cope in other countries and whether, whether you're noticing, are we getting zombie trees? No idea. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> no, no, I, I, seriously, it's, it's something... Um... Yeah, why, why don't we see more zombie trees here then? Because we've got this um, incredible, we've imported trees from all over the world. I mean, take these sequoias I've just been on about, when, when, which are growing, I perceive, very, very successfully in completely the opposite of where they're restricted to in California because that band that Sequoia Sempervirens is, is only a very narrow band. They really are restricted to that zone. Yeah, here, they're every, they're every, we've got some big sequoias in Wales. We've got big sequoias in different places. We've taken them out of that jacket, straight jacket, and put them in other places, and they're doing very well. But mm. I don't know. And I think that is what I'd like to do more and more in these these sort of things is more debate and get people to share and feel confidence in sharing what they've got, because this is what's wrong with ARBs. They will not push themselves to express their knowledge. People still go to foresters because foresters will express their knowledge. I've bumped my thing and shot something off up here. <laughs> anyway, so this is the sort of thing which you're saying, I don't know. But that's the whole thing. The fact that we don't know, and it should be arborists that are doing it. And look at you. You're, a, you're not an arborist, but you're here because you, you like the arboricultural stuff. Well, not forestry. A, I'm a technologist, Teddy. It was you that got me into trees. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah, but you, you, you're not in the plantation trust anymore, are you? Woodland no. Trust, no. JNCC. Um, are you? Uh, yeah. You moved up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, people go in that door and never come out again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good thing or a bad thing. But mm. uh, just related to that, I think it was related to fruit trees. And I think the worry was, was um, the impact it was going to have on the uh, fruit industry that, um, that if yeah. climate change got really bad, that the, the fruit trees just wouldn't fruit and we'd lose all our, uh, yeah. our, all our soft fruits uh, in, uh, if climate change hit too much. So uh, mm. there was an interest in there to sort that out. But uh, anyway. Maybe somebody else can uh, take it. Thank forward. you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, lo lovely. Lovely to see you. you too. Stay safe, matey. Stay safe. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, and hang on a minute. Have I got John and lost Ted? Now, if what has happened here is that Ted has decided he was just on a Zoom chat with John and then pressed leave and then disappeared, then that's awkward. No, there he is. Unmute yourself, Ted. You always went one step further than answering the phone. Well done. I'm not even going to ask what happened there. Um, what, what I'm going to do while, while we uh, almost lost Ted is I just wanted to answer a question that was kind of aimed at me, I guess. So, Ted, if you'll just let me have just a couple of minutes, because um, we'll talk about the England tree strategy again in, in just a second. But um, Leslie uh, asked a question. Leslie was saying maybe someone at the Arb Association can tell us whether or not they, as the lead professional body, had any input into the England tree strategy. Surely this wasn't left only to foresters. And I suppose I am in the hot seat at the moment as someone from the AA. So all I'd say, Leslie, and to others, we, um, the Arb Association certainly did contribute to the consultations when that came out about the England tree strategy. Uh, we wrote a letter to Zach Goldsmith. We filled in the big consultation uh, sort of response. I put a link... Uh, in the chat so that everyone can see it's on our website exactly what we said we did uh, we were quite robust in our views about it um, and basically the key points were we said we didn't think uh, urban trees were 
acknowledged enough in the England tree strategy. Um, trees outside woodlands isn't a phrase I particularly like, but those trees were not properly reflected. We also said that this is part of the problem when mistakes happen and people think that forestry and arboriculture are the same profession when they're two completely separate professions. And if, if you start lumping them together, what you get is a strategy that in which urban trees and arboriculture is lost. So we sort of said to them, if you want to keep this as, uh, <clears throat> if you want to make this an urban tree, if you want to make this a tree strategy, you have to include urban trees on an equal footing with forestry and plantations and the like, or you could rename this the England Forestry and Woodland Strategy, and then we will work with other groups to develop an England urban tree strategy. And some of the points we made were listened to, um, they did pick up on points around establishment rather than planting, but not all of them. So the very short answer is yes, uh, we weren't involved in the writing of it, no, but we did involve uh, get involved in the consultation and we tried to represent our members and our borough culture as a standalone profession as best we could. And I'll put the link in the chat again there. But Ted, I mean, people are here to listen to you, not me. The England tree strategy, you touched on it a bit. Okay. Well, what do you think? First of all, I think I'll send you my letter so you can incorporate it with yours. But um, by coincidence, the next magazine has a bit by me in it, and I don't mind going over it because you're like, you're you're like forgotten what it's all about by the time you get the mag. But it's um, it's to do with Red Riding Hood. So what I've called the the art this the piece I wrote for the mag is um, it's plantation planting paranoia. So everybody thinks that numbers of trees is what they've got to do. I'm not talking about forestry. We need forestry. So you can, I think you can divide it. The importance of forestry and what it does and the importance of what the agricultural people do, the woodland, sorry, the um, blah, 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 wildlife people and any, any people that love planting trees. But why are we going for quantity over quality. So I've written something about it. And what I'm trying to say is basically that open grown trees, we evolved with open grown trees. We evolved with some forest, but it's a myth for now for 20 years, it's a myth that we actually failed the forest to plant crops. We, we, we didn't have to, only an idiot would do it that because the land around him was Savannah and Parkland. And you've got to remember that we, trees and animals didn't evolve before we came along because that's another perception. We evolved with animals and trees. So it's man, trees and animals, or animals, trees and man, whichever way, the six combinations but each one, each, each one of them is just as important. A tree is just as important as man, is as important as the animal. Um, so ever since man stood up, and I, th I think we even started, when we stood up as a hunter-gatherer, we started arboriculture. Yeah? Because we may have protected fruit bushes. We may have protected um, fruit trees. We broke branches off which is the beginning of agriculture, for whatever reason, tree fodder, tree hay, we started to do that. So man stood up and he domesticated some animals, some animals, and he became a wandering nomadic herdsman a long time before he became a settled farmer. It may have been millennia. So that's another myth. And he was living in wood pasture because that is where the food was. The trees produce fruit in the open. Find an orchard of apple trees in a dense woodland or pears or plums. Find trees that fruit in a dense woodland. The canopies in the crown, they fruit, but not below. It's all outside. Look at the number of birds that you find in woodland and the number of birds that nest outside. I told you about the bison in Biel of Asia, same thing. So it's what I call, we were all taught or listened, conditioned 
by Red, reading Red Riding Hood. Our parents taught us, told us about the dark forest. And that's been now even to the BBC. And the scientists I've been with today have never heard of open grown trees or it was all woodland, 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 woodland. No, part of it was. So I call the myth, the Red Riding Hood, I call it fairy tales. Leave the fairy tales to the kids. Don't keep on about forest. Most of it was open, even in the mountains, going the Jura, there's vast areas of wood pasture. And it moved around, it was dynamic. So is that what I'm trying to say to you? I forgot one, well, gone off on one now. Um, so yeah, wait until you see the mag, but I'm, I'm saying that an open grown tree is a giant solar panel, a solar panel. It's nature's, it's most efficient way of gathering sunlight. It's a big dome, it's 360 degrees. And here we are trying to capture carbon in a forest. You get your head round it. And then below that canopy or crown, whatever you call it, what have you got underneath? You've got, I don't like the word grass. I use the word pasture or meadow, herb rich flower meadows, very old ones. Guess what? They're more successful at capturing carbon than a tree. So you've got the tree capturing carbon. Underneath, you've got the, the meadow capturing carbon, two tier. You won't get that in a forest. You have a look how many forests have vegetation underneath them and what's it doing if there is any. So we've got to get back. We've gone so far down this road of thinking about woodland. Forget the word woodland. Start thinking wood pasture. And the agroforestry people, I think, are ahead of all of us that the people that are doing agroforestry are seriously thinking people because they're committed probably investment and their livelihoods to it. So I'm busy trying to get them to stop saying agroforestry because basically the perception of forest today means you cut it down. Let's start again. But we don't want the, the, the agro would pass your people to do that. We want them to keep the tree as long as possible. And the longer you keep the tree, the longer it's gathering carbon. It's common sense. You don't need more than one brain cell, do you? And you no, know, you absolutely don't. You talked about the open grown trees in the meadows there, Ted. And um, Andrea in the chat has said... Uh, it's also the value of hedgerows is often overlooked. We're hearing more about hedgerows and carbon too. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on that element of the, the, the picture. Um, well, of course, hedgerows, if they're along a road, unfortunately need, well, probably give um, arborists work, but um, they are incredibly valuable because basically they are open grown trees. And in the past, presumably, the further you go back, you've got to remember is that uh, in the countryside, in most cases, especially where you had small communities, every tree had a use. Every tree was used. And you used what you had in your particular community. And I've got this phenomenal picture, which you'll see in my book when it comes out. It's taken in Romania, and it's a Romanian village. And because of now my training in recognizing trees from the agricultural world, I can look round and every tree in that picture, every hedgerow in that picture, they're all being used by man. They all have a use, they're doing something. And when we were really thinking about pollarding, we of course, um, um, blah, blah, blah. so I coined the word working tree. They're trees that work for a living, you don't cut them down. So um, I'm losing my way, where are, anybody got any more questions? Well, you, can only, you can only lose your way if, if you are going in a sort of determined direction in the first place, Ted. This is perfect. We can't, we can't, you can't digress from, from one of your talks. It's fine. We've got lots of questions. I can keep going with the well, questions. Yeah, go on, yes. Like. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm gone. That's some 20, 10 minutes of questions, please. We've got 10 minutes. People are saying they want to miss the football to listen to you. We've got a good half an hour. Don't worry about that. Um, okay, because we've been talking about um 
So you talked about plantations in tree planting and you, you use the name I'd never support about the Woodland Trust, but I'm assuming you're talking about the mass tree planting that's being proposed. Some people are asking why you would refer to the Woodland Trust in that way. Don't go into it in too much detail. Many colleagues from the Woodland Trust watching, but we don't yeah, show well, you the tough good. questions. I'm been a, a, I've been quite a fundraiser for the Woodland Trust. I am a great, what's call it, supporter of the Woodland Trust. And I go back years in the Woodland Trust, but it should be taking the lead on planting wood pasture. It, it's a charity. It doesn't have to compete with the FC. And all they're doing is they're getting a few quid and it's numbers, not quality. So they're planting numbers to get paid for them rather than quality. And, they're, and their public think they're doing a good thing to plant numbers. Fortunately, most of them planted so badly that I'm gonna get my wood pasture anyway, so I don't care. And I don't care who says I'm wrong, the Woodland Trust should be planting and pointing out that the, for the benefits, benefits, all benefits of society, including carbon capture, should be open grown wood pasture trees with permanent wood pasture pasture underneath. And I know I mean, I've got them thousands Woodland Trust money because I've been a fundraiser. They are fantastic. And one of my heroes is, um, I'm going to get his name wrong, the founder, a chap that founded it, was a brilliant man. I won't, I won't dance, bore you with his name, because I can't remember it. But he is one of the people, along with Churchill, that I would have loved to have met, because that man had a serious vision. They are Dave Watkins. They're an incredible organisation. And I know a lot of the top people, and I'm not criticising them. I'm merely moaning at them for planting numbers and not quality. And they should be doing it. They're a charity. They're given money by people to have trees for the future, not for, for, for woodland. Yeah, for boys, girls, ladies. They know how I feel anyway. I don't Thank mind you, doing Ted. It. Well, what I'm choosing to take from that is woodland trusts are fantastic. We, I heard you say it. And yeah. that's and that's absolutely true. We got another question on a but similar. They, they, they were all red, red Riding Hood. So they're in the fa they're fairy tale planters. Well, similar but different topic because one thing that um, not just the Woodland Trust but many organisations when when we're talking about tree planting is this emphasis on native trees at the moment. And Gary's asked a good question specifically in Ireland. Um, he's asking what your opinion is. In Ireland, there's a big push for native planting for the benefits that they offer to local wildlife. But in a changing climate, do you think there must be a change in attitude to the planting of more resilient non-native species? And I'm thinking about, you're always talking about the Celtic maple, sycamore, of course, you know, not, not native. Well, we think it is native anyway. But Naturalised. Uh, I, I think we've probably re reached a turning point in where we should be considering so-called non-native trees. Because if we lived, imagine Ireland was attached to Brittany. So therefore it had all the continental movement, natural, um, natural movement of trees. And the natural movement of trees, we're very happy to think of a wood mouse or a J, both being major vectors of moving acorns, we're quite happy for them, birds and animals, to move up seed. Yeah? But what's the difference with man? Yeah, what, what, why, why aren't we considered, the further we go back in time, of being man, uh, being a vector of moving seed? And I think once we can get over that hump and, and not worry so much and not try and def defend the past because... It needs really, really airing. But my thoughts are, if it was me, I would be, I would be considering a lot of what is perceived non-native for the future. I don't know. I don't. I, I mean, I would do it. I mean, when we look at the oaks at Windsor and the, the history of the different oaks at Windsor, where they, the gene banks of the trees and where they've come from, is phenomenal. You know, Charles II charged his bursa. They were the very words he used. Charles II charged his bursa coming from 
France with the chest of acorns. Now, Jill and me actually on a Saturday morning looked at, at the butt of an oak which had been cut down and I got it to the period of Charles II, okay? We still have a debate about that, but I'm pretty certain it is because I surveyed 1,700 trees at Windsor Oaks, and what I found scattered across the Oak Parkland over several miles was five pure Quercus Petraea, Sassar Oaks. And I guarantee they were part of that King Charles II acorns. So five acorns, or at least five, got mixed in with the European rover and got planted out. So they're doing perfectly well. They're beautiful trees. In fact, one of them might be used by, I think it's tree source or somebody, because of its form. It's, got, it's a phenomenal timber tree. So it's good from that point of view. So here, here is, we've been moving seeds around. So why are we now getting all excited? And the other thing is, how do you define a native versus a non-native? I mean, when they look at, they can look at the pollen, they can look in history, they can look at dendrology by finding bits of burnt wood and that sort of thing. But half the trees produce virtually no pollen, which is found in peat bogs. They're insect pollinated. So you've got half the trees wind pollinated. Yes, they'll dump their seed in the peat, but what do you do with a tree that doesn't produce much pollen? So how did they guess the other 50% of the trees which are native and non-native? Tell me about it. So I think it's a huge can of worms, but in light of the, the way the shift in the, the weather patterns and all the rest of it, I, I would seriously think doing it and maybe watch it, maybe whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. And, and of course, in, in urban areas, um, we're always saying it, there should be no distinction between native and non-native in urban areas. You'd be you'd be crazy to just restrict yourself to native trees, native trees, we should say. Which part of the country are we talking about? We say native for a start, but you've got to be looking to diversify your tree stock. That's the message we try and get across. Um, Question from Nev. Neville's asked a question that I like. Uh, oh, while I'm looking for Neville's question, Ted, I'll tell you, um, Anthony, uh, Anthony Mills, hi, Anthony, has said that hi, we, we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago um, with the Tree Council and John Stokes, and Anthony uh, was suggesting to John Stokes that hedges could be used for tree hay if it was cut rather than flailed. And we were all thinking of you when we were talking about tree hay. Yeah, right. Um, one of the big problems with hedges for tree hay is that the, the bulk of thorn which is in them, which if you cut it, um, you can't use it because of the thorn. So what we've done at NET, but the rewilding thing, he, he has established a new, re-established a hedge and I got him to plant all trees and shrubs with no thorns. So that is the first fodder hedge in the world tree fodder, tree hay hedge, okay? That was picked up by a young Belgian and two Dutch. They went straight into it, the can-dos. And we haven't got that attitude of can-do. It's happening, it's happening in Belgium and Holland. And we've only got one in Britain at the moment. The idea is that that, that hedgerow can be harvested at some stage, whether you coppice it, whether you pollard it or whatever you do. And um, Charlie, who's the owner of the place, is an ex-farmer. And we reckoned you could get what was the old baler or harvester, which used to cut the wheat, bale it and shoot it out in a, in a, in a bale bushel, right? It wouldn't take much to make it so that it could harvest the hedge once a year. And sallow, sallow, which I'll get onto if you like, is I just think is we we we've cut sallow and got that much off it three times in a year. And in France, they're way ahead of us, way ahead. And they are already using mulberry as a as a fodder crop. And they're getting they're getting um, um, two crops of 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 of, of um, what did I say? Mulberry. 
So there's a there's things happening. Going back to the fodder and medicine, um, we did kick off hoping that in the part of the world where I am, it's it's horsey culture. You know, they, they spend millions on their horses and millions on their vet bills, and their vet bills, of course, uh, so the horses excrete high amounts of toxins in pharmaceutical products because no pharmaceutical product is tested against the environment. So if you go out around my way now, there's great hoops of horse poo the size of double-decker buses because it doesn't decay down because it's poison. And that's gotten into the soil, that's getting into the water courses. And where I live, we don't have a fly. I don't know what a fly is anymore. You go and look on the poo and it just sits there for years. It doesn't break down. So we know it's full of pharmaceutical chemicals, toxins. So where are they? Yeah. What was that? <laughs> no, that was that was good. That was good. Um, oh, tree, tree. Sorry. Ted, I was going to say occasionally there's a bit of sort of background noise. Don't don't fiddle with anything. But if you're doing something different now that you weren't doing 20 minutes ago, then stop doing that thing. But if you're not doing anything different, then don't start doing anything different. So it's stopped now. It worked. Right. Let's get right. We're going to go on to Neville's question because I started it and then I got distracted. And then we're going to talk a bit about Salo, I think, because that sounds interesting. Um, Neville has asked, are the diseases of tree species growing in woodland different from when the same species are in wood pasture? And Vicky, because we've got some very clever people watching today, Vicky Benson, hi, Vicky, has uh, mentioned in the chat the impact of ash dieback where it seems to be less in ash trees in the open compared with ash trees in woodland. What are your thoughts on all that, Ted? I've got a twinging screw. One of my old girlfriends just stabbed me. Anyway, um, the woodland thing, um, P&D in woodland, I think they would be different anyway. I don't know the answer. We'd have to look at every disease. I mean, the, the root phytophoras, uh, they're on all trees. Vegetation-wise, I don't know, without, without thinking about every, every pest and every disease. I don't know. I don't know. What did Vicky say? Oh, yes, she's sort of a bit of open-grown. Um, Vicky was talking about ash dieback and how it seems more prevalent in uh, ash trees in woodland than it does in ash trees in the open, and sort of a, not an example of what Nev was saying, but related, a related point. Well, you know, I've seen Vicky's ash trees and what she's doing over there, which is, I mean, you should have her on anyway. I'm not going to steal her thunder. Um, but what one of the things I thought about where you do see along motorways and stuff like that, where there is outbreaks of um, ash dieback, I wonder if it's, if it's obviously the same nursery. They bought it in stock in, but was it all from one tree? You know, did the people that collect the seed just go to one tree, which is, um, you, you know, one of the trees which is susceptible anyway to it and hasn't got enough of the genes to suppress it? I don't know. I think it, the, the door is really open, but um, it was the knee-jerk reaction to politicians and the public that don't know enough about things to actually rush in wham bang and the same applies and i really will stick my neck out here is with this, the oak processionary moth because right at the beginning when it kicked off um because of my background of say and anything up to 40 years in pest and disease control there's not one case of where throwing all these chemicals over 40 years at a pest or a disease has ever worked. We're still doing it. We're still paying millions for it. Right. We slow it down, we hinder it. All the sprays that go on your crops to stop different fungi or whatever, they work for a few years, then the fungus catches up. So you've got something less than five years to eight, well, about five to eight years before you've got to find a new pesticide because the fungus is... Different. I went to work, actually, in Imperial College as a technician in 1949. 1949 I went. There, 
there was a corridor and it was all devoted to mosquitoes, malaria. There was another corridor and it was all devoted to locusts. These were good scientists. I want to hear a word against them, but still got locusts, still got malaria. What does that tell you? Yeah, there are vast areas of the world now polluted with insecticides because the insecticides at the time were not proven to be persistent. So we've been bunging all this. Uh, admittedly, of course, somebody's going to get on the phone in a minute and say, come on, Ted, there's lots of bio biological control going on. No, yes, I know. But the spraying of OPM at Windsor, we, I said we ought to try and not have it because Windsor was one of the big concentrations of old trees. And if there were going to be organisms which were going to jump onto this oak processionary moth, that's where it's more likely to happen because of this 7,000 years of continuity. Because once you leave air shores, and hello Sweden, I know you've got some, but if you once they leave air shores and go to Asia, there's probably not another concentration of old oaks. So as it spread, into Europe, it was only oak trees. It wasn't a continuity of ancient old trees. There weren't any. So it had to get to Britain before uh, David Humphreys was telling me that they've got a couple of flies now, which are parasitizing it. But they've been spraying insecticide. So if there were flies that were going to jump onto oak processionary moth, they were killing them just the same. It got, them no, it got us nowhere. We know now we're forward unless we stop spraying and let nature take its course because it's what's going to happen. It's inevitable. We still got this patronizing thing that we know better than nature. Do we? Wait and see. Thanks, Ted. Um, we've got we still got a bit of that interference. A couple of people are asking if your phone is near the computer. And if it is, maybe you should move it further away. No, it's Good meter. Can no, you hear me it's now? Fine. It's not terrible. Someone else said it sounds, uh, Bettina said it sounds like there's a fly trapped in your microphone. But that's fine. We can all hear you. It's not a problem. I'm sure. Oh, it's it's stopped. Fine, now people are saying it's stopped. It'll start again in a minute. Right. I've got a very specific question here from James. Uh, I was going to get James on camera. We've only got about 10 minutes left. So I'll ask it quickly. James is asking, he, he has trouble in identifying the difference between Aspen and Grey Poplar. And he's asking if you've got any tips on that sort of thing. I think aspirin's probably got the more shiny leaf. Um, you know, in other words, it's um, much more silk, it's not silky. It's, uh, it's more shiny on top and bottom. Um, the shapes are very similar. No, don't know, don't know. Reg Harris, I, I was going to say we go ask the wisdom of the crowd as well. And Reg Harris has just said flat PTO. Reg, you're going to have to define which one you're talking about. Go on, Reg. We've got some good people watching this. Everyone chips in. Um, These are all. Good. Sorry, sir. No. We are, uh, yes, right. We're going to do more on Sallow in just a minute. Right. Flat PTO on Aston. There we go. That's what Reg says. Reg knows his stuff. Let's, we've been relatively uncontroversial so far tonight, Ted. So I'm going to ask Dan's question, which is, what are your thoughts on HS2? I actually haven't got one. Um, primarily because uh, it's going to happen. It, it, it's one of those things which I, I just think it's going to happen anyway. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I, I haven't got, I've sat on the fence on it. Um, I was involved with the, the bit from um, Folkestone to London, that bit of the rail, because um, we were looking at Ashen Bank, which is a wooden truss site. Yeah, we were doing the fungi down there. And a chap, the, one of the consultants came up and proudly said, that they were going to move woodland soil from where the rail was going to go. So I said, oh, that means, in those days, I used the word dead wood and didn't say decaying wood as I do now, dead wood. 
I hadn't thought about that. I said, well, the dead wood is the wooden soil of tomorrow. And surely you're going to do that. And why don't you, while you're at it, do what we've been doing at Windsor is say, take some of the dead standing trees that you're going to fell and re-erect them in Ashen Bank, the bit that you're not destroying the Woodland Trust. So they did. They, they moved a lot of the decaying wood on the ground and they re-erected um, uh, 12 monoliths, strapped them up against another tree and I've only ever looked at them once since and uh, they were a lot of them were in a really good condition and the decaying fungi were really working away in them and so were the insects which I refuse to call invertebrates so basically we did a good thing the only thing that went wrong with it was because um, I'm talking about the landscaping or the these engineering um, industry English nature or natural England or whatever it was or the Woodland Trust didn't pick up on the value of what this first, the first for an engineering firm to actually re-erect trees and it got lost. But that should be there as part of their norm now. So all I can ask is if they are going through woodland, um, anybody that's involved in, uh, in it say what's happening are they moving trees? Are they strapping trees up? Vic is there, Nev is there, Reg is there listening to this. They've all talked about it. Why don't we get all these woodlands it's in theory going to destroy, get that part of it re-erected? We don't need a, a partially dead tree. Stick up, tr stick up trees like we have at Windsor, hollow trees or trees and cut cavities in them and chuck dead cats in because there'll be a lot that get run over going up the high-speed railway. So it'll always be moggies to go in there. No, I'm, I'm sorry, pussy. But anyway, so I think we it would be great if there's somebody out there can raise that with the HS2 people, because it's an it was it was done in the um when they did the bit from, as I say, folk, Folkestone to London, and it's never been done again. When they're destroying bits of woodlands everywhere they go so why aren't we doing that why isn't that part of the you know part of the whatever you call it pre prescription well i was mo i'm most surprised to in the time uh, in all the time i've known you that's the first time i've asked you a question and you said i haven't really got an opinion on that hmm. reg has got an opinion uh, i'll call you out for this reg reg says hs2 national disgrace but i'll let you take that up with reg the arboriculture association is not supporting either position necessarily of course uh, right, we, we're going to talk about sallow before we go, but quick question from Tim relating to something you've just said. Um, why don't you like to call them invertebrates, Ted? Well, primarily because it's a play on words. I mean, I think my old professor said to me, when you give a talk or you speak, if you use a complicated word, the chances are you lose your audience straight away. Everybody knows what an insect is. Invertebrates, some of them be sitting there scratching their heads. What, what's he on about? You know, so why not? And I avoid, where possible, using a Latin name. It gets you nowhere. Because 90 time, my 99 times out of 10, the Latin name changes before you've said it. So why bother? We don't need to do it. Insects are in, well, why not? I know it misses out the slugs and all the rest of it but, and other things, but basically it's it's trying, you, we're all trying to get our point across. And the easiest way to do it is if there's, my boss would say, if there's an easy word, the top scientists will know it. And so will the poorest educational person know it. So go, Talk to the lowest denominator and everybody understands. Yeah. Ted, I mean, on that, Ted, would you would you say the same thing about arboriculture? Yeah. We talk, we talk a lot in our industry. One of the problems we have is that nobody knows what arboriculture is. Do you see there being similarities there? We're losing our well, audience. Of course you're chief doctor. I've said already said T doctor. I mean, yes, definitely tree doctor. 
Now, that was tree doctor rather than tree surgeon, wasn't it? I mean, do you think the word arboriculture itself is problematic? Um, I've never really thought about it. I'm not an arborist anyway, so it doesn't matter to me what you call yourself. <laughs> I'm only trying to help. Going on to, because it's getting near the time, um, if we go back to Nomadic Man, he and any any man that or person I should say that has got an animal, if they've got enough animals, they can soon tell you when one of their animals isn't very well. So if you go back to early man when he was wandering around with his animals, he would look at an animal and say it's not looking very well, and then he might see it wander off and start eating a bush or a tree. So. Did he then think that that animal is self-medicating? And did he start thinking, well, I ought to try some of that? So we actually first started medicine from following our animals. And when we get to Sallow, um, I've got some lovely pictures. I land on my feet with pictures. I've got a cow walking up to a Sallow bush and she's bending over some of the branches and she's browsing the sallow. And I thought about it and I thought, well, if she did that every day, because she's going by that bush every day, it would be up here. She wouldn't be able to reach the branches, but she can still do it. So she's not going there every day or an animal's not going to that bush every day because it's recovering and getting its branches lower. So I thought that's self-medicating. Then you start thinking about sallows and willows, salicylic acid, aspirin. So cows knew about aspirin before man. So we are in Scotland, beautiful glen, treeless. There is the bower, whatever you call it, an old broken down stone bower where they protected their animals at night. What's on two corners? A sallow pollard, ancient sallow pollard. The shepherds had put those trees there to be used as medicine. I got three sites in southern Britain, no, two sites in southern Britain and one in Wales, where there are sallows, big sallows, on the edge of where the old cattle compounds were. So sallow in the past was used as tree fodder or tree medicine, right? So why aren't we doing it more? Why aren't arborists beginning to start selling lop and top as an alternative food for, for animals, first of all. And if, if we ever get round to doing it, Reg, and I know you're there, I've got a lovely picture of Reg up a tree, and he's cutting branches off it. And the cow, a big old ancient longhorn, she's come in and she's standing there looking up the tree at Reg, waiting to catch the next branch down, just like a dog with a cat up a tree. And she was, that was instinct. That's an instinct. She saw Reg smell him going up the tree with his saw, and she came in and waited for him to break a branch. Extra food. And she's at nap with all the choice in the world. It's time to pack up. I'm getting sore. <laughs> Let's think about that, then, folks. Show it again, Ted. It might have come to me because my microphone was on. Yep. Perfect. Well, look, oh, there's, there's, there's some questions we didn't get through, but I think this isn't going to be the last time. Ted. Okay, well, I'll stay on if you want me to. No, well, we'll we said we finished at about half seven. It's 25 past. If you've got any points you want to finish on, then you're always more than welcome. Otherwise, you'll be back for another one soon. Enough. Well, um, I've got a roundup, wind up here. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, now I think I think um, I, I've lost my thread now, um, but I do think uh, the fact that your logo, whoever came up with this logo, which I can see on the screen at the moment, came up with it. That to me was a visionary, and it's an open-grown tree. So if you're going to support your logo and you are arguing 
for carbon capture, then there's no question you've got to use this tree. And I'm sorry, Woodland Trust, but if you keep planting plantations just for the sake of a few bob, then I think it as a as a as a brilliant organization which you are, then I'm I'm sorry I'm going to criticize you. But I do know many of you and I know your heart's in the right place really. But you should be the lead. The RSPB has taken the lead, if you like, on bird conservation. We're relying on the push and the eventual, if you like, recognition of the AA as, as the, of, in the tree world from that point of view. But when it comes to establishing trees, trees in our landscape, then I think the trust should take the lead. And we, I we heard one talk today where the, la the lady from Leeds pointed out that in her case, uh, one of these um, open grown trees, maybe not quite mature, a mean tree tree in a street to capture the same carbon you needed over 30 younger trees. So you could argue that the, the more older the ancient tree, the tree is in an open grown form, the more valuable it is. But we don't need to plant thousands of trees. We should plant quality. And these people that plant the trees for you, if they can take care and just plant pit plops, so they plant 10 pit, pit plop trees, open grown, against 100 or 200 plantation trees and slot plant them, then the pit planted trees will be there anything up to 400 years from now. Think about it. You know better than I do, slot planting by amateurs i get my wood pasture because the bloody things all die see ya thank see you, in you the an absolute hero thank you so much it's always see a great pleasure to, to do this thank you uh thank you ted as ever let's do this again sometime i think that we'll have lots of interest if we do it again thank you to everybody who's watching it's really appreciated we'll see you in a couple of weeks time thank you sophie of course for organizing it for all your questions ted Thank you, my friends. Everyone enjoy the football if that's your thing. And we'll see you very soon. Take care.